I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Mary Ellen Iskandarian, the president and CEO of Women's World Banking, a global nonprofit devoted to giving more low-income women access to the financial tools and resources they need to prosper. She's also the author of the book titled, There's Nothing Micro About a Billion Women, in which she talks about the 1 billion women worldwide who have been completely excluded from any formal financial or banking system. In this episode, Mary Ellen discusses how women globally disproportionately bore the economic cost of the pandemic. And for many women, the concept of microfinance has been an economic lifeline, especially for women in developing countries. This is a really fascinating topic, one that doesn't get a lot of coverage. And I think it's important to understanding what tools are at the disposal of the banking industry to help women all over the world succeed and thrive financially. So. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mary Ellen Iskandarian of Women's World Banking. Mary Ellen Iskandarian, welcome. Thanks so much, Jen. Great to speak with you. You know, so I think by now it's well understood that women worldwide were disproportionately affected economically, financially by the pandemic. And in the U.S. alone, I think by spring of this year, there were approximately two million fewer women in the workforce. And that was primarily due to, to, you know, women having to leave the labor force to take on child care when schools were closing and daycares, you know, but that was just in the U.S. So can you give me a picture of what it was like for women globally? That is, you know, one of the one of the universal experiences that I think women did share in the pandemic, if anything, it was really shining a light on what's been there forever. Women, you know, across the globe carry much more of the burden of childcare, elder care, keeping the household afloat. You know, women often refer to it as sort of the third shift that there's the work, the home, and then all of that other stuff that men are not necessarily expected to or do contribute to the same extent just was so heightened with kids being sent home from school during during the pandemic and that homeschooling burden disproportionately falling on on women, women not being able to then return to the workforce as schools had such a sort of spotty reentry and reopening experience. So, you know, it is one of those things that the women across the globe really shared. Then on top of that, you had women in positions that were often the first to get hit by business closures or being on the front lines, they were certainly very, you know, highly represented in the front lines of healthcare as nurses and first responders. But then you had them working in service jobs in other kinds of professions that without people traveling, without people going to restaurants, you know, those those kinds of more service related positions just losing that that source of income. So it was a it was really a bloodbath for women economically in so many respects. You're right. Um, It was a bloodbath. And, you know, we talk about the economic recovery that's happening now. And often in those reports, you don't hear about the fact that, you know, though there is an economic recovery, only a small percentage of the work loss that was on women has happened, right? Like women have not recovered those jobs and the work that they've lost during the pandemic at the same rates that men have. Exactly. That's very true. I think the global picture is a little nuanced and, you know, some of the things that may not hit us so hard here in the, in the U S for example, really came to the fore in some of the developing countries that women's world banking works in. We saw, you know, an enormous influx of relief payments from governments over the course of the pandemic. In many countries, they were delivered in only digitally, only through cell phone technology and in some countries, like India, for example, the first wave of relief payments when the lockdowns first started in India were only payable to women and only payable digitally. And so you saw in record short time, 25 million new bank accounts opened and primarily by women and access to digital technology that had previously been a real issue, real gender gaps in ownership of cell phones and access to digital technology just accelerated by virtue of this these global payments. So it's something that people like me have been hypothesizing for the last several years about payments kind of being an on-ramp for other financial services really did turn out to be true in the pandemic. So is this something that was detailed? I know there was a report that was recently released, the Global Findex report, the latest one, 
Does it include details like this or what's it actually in that report that's important for us to understand? You're spot on. The Global Findex is kind of the gold standard database of what are people's relationship to financial products, financial services, financial institutions, how did they manage their financial lives? And it had been delayed by a year. It comes out every three years. It had been delayed by a year with COVID. So everyone was very eagerly looking to see what did this massive influx of digital payments do for the global financial system? And so we did see that close to 250 million more women in the developing world gained access either to a bank account or a mobile money account. And that is just, that's an extraordinary growth. You saw for the first time a reduction in the gender gap for many, many years. We've been mourning the fact that the 9% gender gap between men and women in terms of their inclusion in the financial system, their ownership of bank accounts in their own name, you know, had been at that 9% that really wasn't budging. It fell to 6% overall in the emerging markets. But I think it's equally important for us to look kind of behind those numbers because we still see, you know, Bangladesh and Nigeria have 20 percentage point gender gaps, Pakistan at 15, Tanzania at 13. So there's a nuance in those numbers. We unfortunately can't say game over. There's been progress, but there are some countries, unfortunately, that even saw a widening of the gap in the pandemic period. But the numbers clearly indicate to us that opportunity for payments to bring people into the system and keep them there in order to take usage of other financial services. Well, that's a lot. You said 250 million new accounts for women were opened during this period. Is that right? In the developing world. In the developing world. So do we know what the original cause of these gender gaps and these markets being exclusive for women, excluding women rather? At Women's World Banking, we really think about the barriers and sort of three three pillars, three buckets, whatever you, you like. The first one is about barriers that the woman herself faces. We see women both real and frankly perceived, feeling that they have less financial literacy, less financial confidence. And that's frankly only exacerbated by digital literacy and how comfortable and confident they feel navigating the cell phone once they you know, gain access to it. So that digital literacy is important. Just an awareness of their options, the access to the cell phone, to even know that the cell phone is going to be that gateway to financial services is, is a real gap that women face. Women tend to express a higher degree of, if not actual mistrust, but a higher barrier to trust of financial services. It takes a while. They ask a lot of questions. They need to really feel that the financial institution is quote unquote for them. We hear that so often amongst the women that we work with, this sense that that bank really isn't for them in a way that we don't tend to hear it for men. The second group of barriers is amongst the financial service providers themselves who still, despite so much good data to the contrary, still don't really think there's a business case for serving this population. And that's really where Women's World Banking tries to be very clear in showing the way of what a successful financial product, financial service to that low-income woman who is a very good client once she's banked, and she's a very loyal client. There's a lot of data showing that women have higher net promoter scores with financial service providers than men. They have, and they tend to stay longer. You'll see that in even in developed countries, women will be with a financial service provider for five years at almost double the rates that men will. They'll, men tend to, to shop around a little bit more and be less loyal. And then that third bucket is really all about What are the regulators doing? What can the regulators put in place in terms of policies and regulatory frameworks to make sure that there's a level playing field? And there we really feel if they do nothing else that regulators around the world could insist that the banks and other financial service providers reporting into them require sex disaggregated data. So data saying, how are women versus men handling a product or a service? How are they using it? What volumes are they using it? What parts of the country are they using it in? 
that kind of data is shockingly still just all reported just as one block of numbers rather than looking deeper at the breakdown of who the client is. So that would be huge. Then I think the next thing we'd love to see them do really relates to women's entrepreneurship and access to capital for businesses. In so many countries, the only thing that a bank will secure a loan with is actual property or physical real estate. And we still see in far too many countries, women are prohibited from owning property, inheriting property, having the right to dispose of that property without their husband's permission. And so again, at Women's World Banking, we're working with many governments to broaden the idea of what could a secured loan actually be secured against? Could it be accounts receivable or a piece of equipment you know, in the United States, the I read somewhere that 86% of the loans written in this country for small businesses could never be written in most of Africa because of that requirement of real estate, which is just an asset that women are much, much less likely to own. Just the piece of data that you mentioned, do we know why the gap was widened in some cases? For many of the same reasons that we were talking about women being so much harder hit by the pandemic, you saw families, you know, having to cut back on expenses. If a family is going to have a cell phone at all and a smartphone that is internet enabled and allows financial services to be, you know, to be accessed, it's going to be in the hands of a man. And women, interestingly, know that they may share a phone to make calls or to use the internet. They're not going to bank on a shared phone, that desire for confidentiality of their financial transactions is really strong and something we hear very consistently for women. So when choices about phone ownership are made in a household, unfortunately, the women are not the ones to own. The GSMA, which is the industry association for the the mobile phone industry, in their, they do a, a wonderful gender gap report every year. And they did find in this last year that sort of progress in women's handset ownership has really stalled. Again, worldwide, see a 16% gender gap in ownership of that cell phone. And unfortunately, a lot of that initial progress that came out of that digital payment tsunami that I referred to earlier, where governments were really providing those relief payments in the, the first part of the pandemic, in 2021, we unfortunately saw that slowing. We had those discussions in the US similar discussions when we were talking about relief payments. And I would imagine that here there is a gender gap. It's just, you know, as well as a poverty gap. But there were questions about, well, if we're going to send relief payments to people who need it the most, there's a good chance that they may be unbanked, right? I'm not really sure what the conclusion was to that or whether we were able to get, you know, checks out to people who didn't necessarily have bank accounts. But it's something that happens globally. But I would imagine it happens more often in developing countries. It does. Although, again, it's one of those things that There's so much really solid data from both the developed and the developing world on how much better off a family, including the men in that family, are if a relief payment goes directly to the woman. Everyone in the family eats better. You see healthcare being better and a prioritized expense. Women are much more likely in difficult times when they have access to keep the kids in school and both girls and boys. We will be unfortunately reaping the sad harvest of millions of girls having been taken out of school during the pandemic who will not return to school. And we know that an additional year of education in a girl's life, incredible implications both for her and any children that she ultimately has, but the economic impact of keeping that girl in school so that, you know, affects her lifetime income, the lifetime income of her children and her extended family. You know, there's almost literally no better in development investment than keeping a girl in school. You know, it's interesting. That's the opposite of the perception of women and money <laughs> and the stereotypes, right? So, you know, in your book, there is a story in the very beginning of a woman in, in Kenya who wanted to open a hardware store in her neighborhood. And you talk about that, you know, entrepreneurship, the spirit of entrepreneurship and her lack of access to traditional capital or traditional financial services. And can you explain her scenario and how it's similar to other women in other parts of the country? I guess this this is micro lending or microfinancing. Thank you so much for bringing Joyce up because she plays this really almost outsized role in my own life because 
I met her on the first trip to Africa that I, I took when I joined Women's World Banking. And she was, she opened my eyes to so much about what the impact of giving women access to capital to grow their businesses can do. But yes, you, you know, you did a great little summary. She lived in a village. She and her husband really just were not able to put together an, enough income coming into the, the household for their, their growing family. So he went off to the city. They live closer to Mombasa, the second largest city in Kenya, and you know went off to get a job there. And she stayed behind with the kids. And she just saw so many people in her village making repairs to their homes, you know, additions, improvements to their homes. And she really thought a hardware store would be you know, a valuable business in the community. I always tell the story, she showed me a photo, you know, it was many years hence, but she showed me a photo of her original store. And it was a literally a little shack or a kiosk on the side of the road that she sold some loose nails and some previously used two by fours, some eggs and some tomatoes. So kind of no hardware store you or I may have ever seen. But when she went to the bank to see whether she could borrow in order to expand, they wanted, as I was saying earlier, they wanted collateral in the form of property that she did not own. They wanted cash in the bank that she had to hold in the bank as a deposit against the loan. It was you know, just a level of restrictions and requirements that just were beyond her ability to meet. And she did learn of a microfinance bank, Kenya Women's Finance Trust, an organization that Women's World Banking has worked with for, for decades. And they made a $70 loan, unsecured. So they just were looking at whether her business would generate enough cash to repay that loan. They gave her some training on sort of basic business skills, budgeting, very important message about keeping the business's finances separate from the family finances. And, you know, sort of the rest was history to a certain extent. She grew the business. She now has, seven years later, she has $3,000 revolving line of credit. Business that I was standing in talking to her about was a really bustling hardware store with everything you'd expect to see in it. And then, you know, the thing that was so powerful to me in, in meeting her and talking with her was the way she talked about her success you know, she was literally standing in this business that she had grown and she was absolutely, you know, confident in that success and able to talk about the, you know, the economics of her business. But the way she really measured her success was the fact that all of her kids had gone, you know, completely through secondary education, gone on to college. She had helped put her sister through graduate school. And now her husband was actually returning from the city and had become her 26th employee. And he was helping her build a new business. She was opening a lumber yard sort of out behind the, the store front. And it was just, it was such a powerful story of 25 jobs that she made possible for people in the community. Women, and Joyce was no exception, are more likely to hire other women. So those issues of labor force participation that you were talking about earlier tend to be addressed by women entrepreneurs when they're given an opportunity. There's very clear data showing the ability to create jobs is directly linked, directly correlates with the ability to borrow, to grow your business. So access to capital is not just about the immediate investment into the business, but has so many implications for the health of the family, the vibrancy of the community. You know, I love that story, especially the ending where she ends up hiring her husband, her husband right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then, you know, not only that, this is something she can pass along to her children if she wanted, you know, if they wanted to go into this line of work. And, you know, she's creating some generational wealth, there's assets there. But I'm curious as to what that story would have looked like had her husband opened the building or just any man, any man had tried to open this business and tried to get capital. How would it have differed? You know, my sense is, you know, unfortunately for this family that was quite low income, the chances that he actually owned property that he could pledge as collateral was equally low. The thing that we see with men though, and again, there's a lot of research and I, I point to quite a bit of it in my book, is they are so much more able to, you know, that, that whole concept of friends and family capital. I talk at length about a 
series of focus groups that we were able to sit in on for actually Kenya's largest bank was looking to change its approach with small businesses. And one of the men in one of the focus groups talked about, you know, a boss that he'd had, you know, really liked his idea for starting up a business. He was given a loan to start it. And when he went to repay the loan, the boss said, oh, keep it. You've done such a great job. You're like a son to me. I'm so proud. I can assure you that would not have happened to any of the women in Joyce's village, that friends and family money is so much less likely to flow to them. We see that women are much more likely, and this is a developed country thing too, much more likely to rely on savings to start a business than men are. And men's ability to sort of talk to talk others into, you know, buying into their ideas is much greater at the risk of making a big leap here. It's one of the reasons <laughs> I'm so excited to see, you know, models like peer to peer lending in the technology space. Women have done really well on peer to peer lending platforms because, you know, they can demonstrate that their business idea is a good one, is sound, is making money. And so you've seen women really do quite well. Unfortunately, there is a, an emerging bit of research showing that people on peer-to-peer -peer platforms are excited about women's businesses and lend to women's businesses, but do require higher thresholds of profitability for women's businesses before they'll lend to them than for men. So, you know, that bias is still there, but it is exciting to see that, you know, when women can make a case for their business, they're being listened to. You know, the question that keeps coming to mind or the idea that keeps coming to mind is that things like peer-to-peer -peer lending and micro-lending, they only exist because of inequality, right? Yep, yep. I mean, so it's great. And I love these stories. And I'm glad that, you know, um, Joyce was able to get the capital that she needed. But I wonder if she had access to, you know, the full financial services, you know, what she could do. And I just wonder, you know, what direction is ideal here, right? We, we don't want to necessarily live in a world where women can only rely on peer-to-peer -peer lending or micro lending. If she had gotten more than $70, she had gotten the, the line of credit for $3,000 to begin with, what would her life and her business look like right now? That's so interesting that you remark on that because so much of the early conversation about microfinance was all about it addresses a market failure. And I don't think that's, unfortunately, in the you know nearly 50 years that the formal microfinance movement has been in place, that market failure has maybe improved, but not entirely been addressed. It is one reason I am so hopeful about the role that fintech can play in recognizing this client segment for what it is. Because, you know, women with the fintech loans, you're able to kind of leapfrog over some of the security issues, these, these, the collateral issues that we've been talking about. You've got digital lenders creating credit scoring models, algorithms that are not based on some of the traditional things that go into traditional credit bureau or traditional credit score, where if you were Joyce trying to get a loan, if you don't have that history to show a lender, you're just not ever given that first shot at getting a loan. And that's where fintechs who look at things like how timely have your repayments on your utility bills. There's a lot of uh, modeling that's been done around how timely are you in topping up your cell phone, for example, and drawing algorithmic conclusions and predictive AI conclusions from certain behaviors that show up on your phone. Now, of course, there's bias there as well. And you know, you see things like one that I can't believe, there's some credit score that draws data around and assigns a gender to how many times you turn the flashlight on on your phone. I have no idea what possible correlation to gender that is, but for, you know that's an example of how digital algorithms are drawing on all sorts of data that can be a real boon to women. We've got to make sure that those biases are addressed. I'm just curious, <laughs> if you turn your flashlight on more often, what does that mean? What does that imply? I mean, does that mean that like women can't see in the dark? I don't know. No, I have no idea. I just, it was one of the, my colleagues, Women's World Banking has published a really fascinating piece on gender bias in credit algorithms. And they did a 
fabulous table showing, you know, some of the data that gets collected. And when I saw the flashlight, you know, like, what's the, the gender implication of the flashlight? I'm afraid I bring it up, but I can't tell you exactly what it means. You know, the one thing I might just close with is, you know, we see an enormous opportunity with digital finance for women. And you may have seen that last week, Women's World Banking and the United Nations Capital Development Fund launched a coalition of actors to raise awareness of and access to digital financial inclusion for women. So we're inviting anybody who might be interested in promoting this, whether they be you know, legacy financial service providers, fintechs, other NGOs who are interested in women's empowerment to join us in this effort. And there's lots about it on our website, womensworldbanking.org. I think it is the future. This database that we were talking about earlier has really shown the promise of digital technology in addressing women's exclusion. So join us in this coalition to further the cause. Do you think that we've taken away any valuable lessons from the creative ways that financial institutions were able to, to get money to people who didn't traditionally have access to these financial in institutions that we can take away from the pandemic and apply it long term? You know, so many other industries have figured out customer centricity and getting to the customer, meeting them where they are, not requiring the customer to contort themselves or come up, you know, meet requirements or compliance that is out of their reach. The financial world was really, really slow in recognizing the importance of getting that customer where they were. And when, you know, we were all under lockdown and the client had to be reached in different ways, I do think the financial service world really started to rethink, but it was the fintechs and the digital providers that got kind of got there first. Mary Ellen, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for all of the work you've done. And this is a really enlightening conversation for me. I, I didn't know anything about this world and, and now I do. <laughs> thank you so much for your interest. Really enjoyed being with you.